Hello and welcome along to another RTE Rugby podcast. Another Six Nations break weekend is coming up. So that just means we've got more time to look back on Ireland's win against Wales and look ahead to the round four game against England at Twickenham next week. To do all that, Bernard Jackman and Johnny Holland are with me. Good morning, fellas. How are we doing? Good, thank you. Morning. Good, thanks. How are you? We'll, we'll start, guys, with the, the reaction to Ireland 31, Wales 7 from Saturday. A record equaling 11th win in a row, Bernard. 18th win in a row at home. Maximum points through three games. But if Tygburn doesn't go over for that try at the end of the match to bring up the bonus, is the reaction a little bit different in the days that follow? Yeah, no, I think so. But I, I think it'll be very hard for Andy Farrell to to be overly critical because the effort um, was there and the intent. Uh, in actual fact, I think if he was going to be critical, he would say that we probably tried to move the ball too much nearly um, and we probably weren't as direct as we needed to be. And, um, and in fairness to Wales, they, I thought they defended really well. I think even though Sean Edwards has gone five years now, still a strong part of the Wales DNA is how they want to defend. Um, their attacking game has gone back a long way. Their kicking game has obviously got issues in it, but that's still there. That's his legacy. And, and they, we, we did find it hard to break them down despite having an incredible amount of field position and possession. Um, a couple of lineups went astray in the first half, which probably... You know, we would have turned into points, but yeah, in general, I think we just weren't as accurate as we need to be. Yes, it was a clear gulf in class. Um, and you know, I don't think anyone in that stadium who was Irish fans going into it believed that we wouldn't win. And probably during the game, there was no real scary moments. You know, that third quarter, we weren't brilliant, but we had a two score lead at all times, and um, yeah, we were pretty comfortable. I know, Johnny, I say like we'd be having a different conversation if Tiger Byrne doesn't go in for that try, but. The fact that he did go in for the try also says a lot about the team and the the ruthlessness and the demand to want to go for the full 80 minutes. Like I was writing about it on Monday morning. I was reminded of the opening World Cup game against Romania when Ireland won whatever 80 something points to five or eight or something like that. And Ty Byrne is sprinting up the pitch in 40 degree heat in Bordeaux to just get the 12th and final try in that match. And I remember Andy Farrell afterwards was over the moon just about that try in particular. Like he was buzzing about it that they just did not want to stop. And then you go back further to that that scrappy game against Fiji about 18 months ago at the Aviva where Andy Farrell was, was really, really annoyed after the match that Ireland just kicked the ball out of play to bring up the 80 minutes when the match was sewn up after what had been a, a scrappy enough performance. Even on the days when things aren't going right, you can see there is a a desire and a and a hunger in the team to want to to milk every second out of those eighty minutes and put on any extra score they can possibly find. Yeah, there is, and I think the the attacking um, energy from Ireland is clearly there. Like you know, when when Andy Farrell came into us at Munster, he was consulting for a while in, in my last year there. I think. Um, his bit, and I actually said this to a school player during the week that his his criticism was that Irish players would find it in them to have this mindset around defence, but they don't have the same mindset around their bouncing attack. And it was something that's kind of stuck with me. Why aren't you buzzing around the place like the attack? You need to be as ruthless on not getting on someone's shoulder or you know the same effort levels in attack as well. So obviously it's something that he's quite consistent with. Still, I think it's it's you know if your defence isn't isn't buzzing and getting off the line, you'll be found out quite quite easily. The opposition score. If an attack you're not, you know, doing as much as you can, no one's going to say like, you know, geez, he he really messed up there. He could have been on the shoulder because they won't see it probably, you know. So it's a very interesting thing. But the other thing is, um, like I don't, I don't think, you know, the the Six Nations, yeah, the trophy may be won eventually on a on a bonus point, but the Irish uh, ambition isn't to win the championship only on a bonus point, if you know what I mean. So like the win will do them because they're going on to get two more wins, hopefully. You know, that's what they're where the mindset of that. Obviously, you want to do that with, um a clean sweep and get your bonus points along the way. And I think that probably your point really is towards their performance and converting their chances really, isn't it? And the, the bonus point puts the, the icing on top a small bit, but Ty Byrne is an absolute freak. Like he went off for 10 minutes and came on and uh, won the ball in a mall in a similar fashion to how he got Simbin and he had no fear. And obviously he's been backed that way as well. Like, you know, just go on and be himself again, you know? So I think um, he's a complete freak, but Wales were punched drunk by the end of the game. So the fact that Ireland got the, the try, like you see, uh, some of their players are literally just like, you know, dizzy getting to rocks and, you know, Ireland got over, but you see the damage that they did to, to Wales, even in the, 
the long phases of play, the seven minutes of play, where it obviously took its toll on everyone. Uh, knowing Bundyaki went in under a post and the, the try was chalked off. You see Jack Crowley going down on his knees like he's absolutely out on his feet, but Ireland are able to find another gear. And I know you were talking about their fitness and defence and all the rest of it, but their, their, their work rate and the levels that they can get to above other teams is quite evident, evident at the moment. Yeah, and like that fitness and work rate is... You could really see it on Saturday. And Birch, like obviously, I, I don't know, Johnny, did you see it? But there was that video doing the rounds of Dylan Lewis of mm-hmm. Wales in the last couple of minutes before that tie burn try. And, you know, there was it was the joke, you know, look at how tired this prop is. But like it just showed the like, yeah, you can have a giggle about it. But this, the serious point wasn't like this player is unfit. It, it's like this is what Ireland are doing to teams. And this is how they're they're stretching them to the point of of absolute exhaustion through you know whether it's just the the standards of play or but their ability to to go through 10 15 phases in open play we saw what was it 44 minutes bernard ball in play there was a a 7 7 minutes and oh. 8 seconds 7 minutes and 6 seconds point after Ty burn got his yellow card um some people might suggest maybe should Ireland have actually just put the ball out of play a couple of times in that period and given themselves yeah. either and manage that period a little bit better. I don't know. Well, look, they've been training. They've been training for those long bouts since, um, since the All Blacks had that late late try under Joe Schmidt. Um, so since that, um, Ireland have and all the Irish provinces go deep at training and you know regularly and and seven minutes is very long now. To be fair, like yeah. three minutes at the time. Um, which the All Blacks kept the ball for was a long stint. Um, and then obviously it went to four and a half minutes. I think Ireland when, Ar- when Johnny Sexton got the drop goal, that was about four and a half minutes. Um, ball in play in, in one phase, and now you're getting the seven. I don't look. I don't even think. I think sometimes those long stints actually are boring. To be fair, uh, because sometimes it's not likely you're going to make a a line break for for a lot of it. Um, and but I think what Ireland are very confident was that effectively. That suits them. So Ireland, Ireland, when you look at how Ireland play, they're quite smart. They're smarter than every other team. So if Ireland felt that they they weren't going to benefit from that, well, not, maybe not straight away, but certainly at the at the death. You know what I mean? Like you see that that example of Dylan Lewis is is just it's a really good example. It's really, it looks really harsh on him because yeah. you know he misses the tackle at the end. He's out in his feet. He's punched drunk, and he he's, he makes he's, a couple along the way as well. In fair, no, 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 no. I, 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 I said it's harsh. Like yeah. I think. If you look at him, I mean, he he could have parked up somewhere and left to somebody else. So I actually, I admire him, uh, but I think it was a brilliant short clip that showed how okay, it's he's the isolated defender in this situation. But that happens throughout the game. In in the seven minute block, there you know Ireland when they had the possession would have been asking the right questions of of people, and eventually they, they drop if they don't have that um, training methods. Now not just in their in their club team or in their, in their international side but also their club and Quinn's you know I spoke to Jerry Flanny about it Quinn's train fast but um, it's not the same level as where Dylan Lewis plays now it's not the same level as international rugby and 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 uh, it's something that the Irish teams are incredibly fit and I think we sometimes focus on our tactical smarts and our, our technical ability to execute but a lot of that's down to actually you know being actually fit enough to execute it rather than actually, if you see Dylan there, like he, it's a very extreme example, but like he's just so wrecked, he can't execute the last one. You know what I mean? Um, whereas if you look at Ireland's clean outs and and pass quality and, and execution technique, etc., all the way through the game, we're very constant. And and the fairness, you know, you look at the stats for the bench that came off, come on, their impact, and that's not as easy. Like it's actually not easy sometimes to come off the bench when they get uh, and get straight into it and get big numbers, but those players did again at the weekend. So for Wales, that would be that would have been really difficult. Like, I mean, they're playing in regions where the, the the training levels aren't anywhere near what they are in the Irish provinces, and then to go from from that, it's like you know coming off uh, coming out of the layby and go straight into the, into the into the fast lane. Like it's just such a jump up for them, mm. and they're incredibly brave, but they didn't. They're not equipped. They're not equipped at the moment to do it. Um, and also, and and like also, our team's playing the Champions Cup. That's another level. That's closer to international rugby. So it's logical what's happening. Um, but you know, it's down to it's down to the structure of our game and and how everything is aligned. To be honest, mm, it certainly is. And like, there are a few better examples of us of the work rate and the fitness levels than someone like Caelan Doris, 
Johnny, who has, uh, by my count now, hasn't missed an Ireland game since the 2021 Six Nations. Uh, I think we're 30 plus games in a row uh, that Caelan Doris has played for Ireland. But you look at the numbers that he put up on Saturday, for example, again, and this is just week on week stuff. 21 tackles, 12 carries, 28 uh, own rock arrivals, 12 opposition rock arrivals. That, like, add up those four, you're talking 70 plus, 70 plus breakdowns that he was involved in, or 20, 21, you know, tackle areas that he was involved in out of, we'll say, 280, 290 ish. Basically, one in four phases of the game, Kaelin Doris was, was involved in. It's a ridiculous level. It's a, just an outrageous work rate across an 80 minute game. I think Kellen Doris is a is a disgrace of a cheat code. To be honest, he's a he like when you look at that as well, he he's the one when when Ireland set up their kind of um you know what we'd call their set piece from counter attack, he's the one carrying the ball back. He's eating up meters. But then when you see his actual actions on the ball, it's all footwork. Like he doesn't just fall into context. His footwork is like an NFL player, you know, like that Andrew Conway kind of short steps, get around someone. Uh, even if it's just going into contact, he gets them off balance. Like he's just he's really effective and then he's always challenging at the break. And I saw a clip where Andrew Porter got the turnover, um, but it was Caelan Doris acting the maggot in the rock beforehand that, you know, cut uh, Thomas Williams, uh, got him a bit off balance and, and, and all of a sudden there's no support there. So I think he's uh, he's very, very effective and he's classy. He's, he's also one of those players that he doesn't really take a break, does he? Like when when the team has been rotated, Caelan Doris te- seems to stay. I remember in the World Cup thinking, Surely you have to rest this guy because he's so important to us. And he's playing all the games. Like, I don't know. He just seems to be uh, very robust and then also very effective in what he's doing. Yeah, like I, I went back and looked at this uh, uh, last week when he had that little bit of a, a niggle and we weren't sure was he going to play. Uh, the last game he missed for Ireland was the... Uh, it was the final game of the 2021 Six Nations. Do you remember, he, he missed that entire 2021 Six Nations. Yeah, concussion. The, the concussion issues. And he has played every single game since. He has started... All but one of those games. I think it was Italy, the World Cup warm-up game uh, back in August was the only time he came off the bench in that block as well. So just a ridiculous, ridiculous durability, Birch, for you're talking, what, three years now? Yeah, and like he's he's world-class. I mean, I, I um, we know he's very good, but when you speak to some of the pundits from other countries or, or some of the, um, the, the current players, they're like... They rate him like so highly, and um, the scary thing is he's probably going to get better because um, uh, he's he's getting more of a leadership role. Um, uh, he's constantly evolving. The, the The front five he's playing in front of or behind are getting better. You know, um, I think you look at the form of Ty Byrne now, Joe McCarthy, uh, Porter, Dan Sheen, etc. So he's going to be on the front foot even more. Um, and yeah, it's 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 scary how 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 good he, he will eventually become because he's probably the, for me he's uh, he's probably the best number eight we've had. And that's a big statement, but I think he is. If you're an up and coming Irish number eight, are you reconsidering your position at the moment? Maybe thinking I might might try and move up to the second or I could become a first centre or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at Gav Coombs. I mean, you know, it's not by choice and much injuries, but like. He has played a little bit in the second row. If you're Gav Coombs, who who is a standout eight, you know, who's not in the squad, um, his form has been exceptional for Munster. Um, how, many, how many how many caps would Gavin Coombs have if he was Scottish or Welsh? Yeah, yeah, he'd be he'd be starting every week. I I, I think you know what I mean you look at yeah. look at the impact he has for Munster, um, and that's that's hard on on Gav, but uh, it's 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 a luxury for Andy Farrell. Certainly is, um. While we're talking individual players, Johnny, Kieran Frawley is someone we've been talking about for pretty much two straight weeks now, ever since we, we heard Hugo Keenan was going to be a major doubt for, for that game against Wales. The good news is Hugo Keenan, according to himself anyway, yesterday we were speaking to him at a at a media event. He says he's on track to play. Gary Ringrose is likely available as well. But on Kieran Frawley, who came in for, for Hugo Keenan, um what were we what were we so worried about? Uh, were we? <laughs> no, I'm, uh, so okay. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think uh, Kieran Frawley's a, I think he's a Rolls Royce of a player. Like, I think he's actually very good. He just needs more opportunities. And obviously, we know that from you know the New Zealand tour that he was he was ahead of Jack Crowley, wasn't he? So, like, you know, that that's where he was at. And obviously, Andy Farrell's a big fan of him. But he had some lovely moments. He took control of the game in that kind of 
third quarter maybe. He, he had two lovely, what I call, bridge passes or kind of looping passes over the defence, uh, which, you know, there was none other. Like, and then he had two kick passes in the same phase of play. I'm not sure whether the second one was the right decision, but he was in there just obviously pulling the strings and getting the ball, putting it there. And then he's back in there, getting the ball, putting it the other way. So I thought he was very confident. And obviously the way he took his try under the post, you know, he, had, he had some very, very good moments. And I think um, he solved the problem twice that Ireland had an attack. They weren't sure how they were going to beat this defence. And I think that's probably my only criticism of, of the performance at the weekend um, was that I don't think there was, maybe I'm wrong now, but I don't think there was massive clarity on how they were going to, break up that Welsh line speed. They weren't sure if they were going to go around it and keep their depth and play with offloads like we saw in the first quarter. And then, um, you know, they got kind of stuck not getting over the game and going a little bit lateral as a result of that because I don't know if they were deep enough or maybe ballsy enough to go over it. Um, and then in the when the, the when the third quarter broke up, getting into the final quarter of it, maybe there was a bit of fatigue uh, getting in there as well. Um, but they decided to go through it and they went through that Welsh uh, defence and they got on the front foot and all of a sudden the game started coming on a small bit more. Now that's, also, considering they went 17 and up, they were obviously in full control, but I don't think they were very comfortable with how they were going to do it. I don't know if there was massive clarity on whether they are going through, over it, or around it. Uh, I didn't see the template very clearly, uh, which they will need to know when they get to England. I don't think the English defence is what it wants to be at the moment, and I, I know there's talk of you know 10 to 15 games before they really get into the South African way, maybe, and, uh, and that's quite clear at the moment. They're not there yet, but you know, they will fly off the line. I think they'll shut the back door a little bit better again. I think Elliot Daly and these guys just get up into that space. And uh, possibly it's a little bit easier when you know they're going to be there. You can go deep, deep or over the top. Um, but the Welsh seem to have a sort of balance in that defence that they got to grips with Ireland and really, really frustrated them for, was it 30 odd minutes, 36 minutes or something they didn't score for, which we're not used to for Ireland. Yeah, Birch, I know you have similar thoughts on Ireland's kind of lack of I don't know, is clarity the right word? Andy Farrell said they were quite passive in attack in that first half. But I know just from what Johnny said there, I've I've heard you speaking in the last few days and you've similar thoughts on that. Yeah, I I, I don't know if it's like a clarity. I just think that we um we maybe thought we could get our that our, our short passing game um was gonna be enough rather than actually focus on hard carries and and, and, and fast cleans. Um and you could argue that you know, but because we had such ball movement, that that played into the fatigue that Wales eventually had. Uh, but I actually think now we actually have the power. When you look at Robbie and and Bundy, when you you know you bring James Lowe running um ar- around a rook, when you look at Doris, um Joe Porter, Furlong, Sheen, etc. I think we actually can run run over teams, and I think probably in hindsight they would have said, you know, we should have maybe started more direct, um and then. Let, let uh look for options out the back, etc. When Welsh defenders were a little bit tireder and were more likely to just bite in a little bit, um. So, but again, you know, when you looked at how Wales defended the first half against Scotland, um, and at certain times against England, you probably thought that ball movement was the was the way forward. I thought it was a better Welsh performance defensively than they put in in the previous two games. Um. So to be fair. They stepped up there um, and were very difficult to break down. And then a couple of passes went to ground, um, which in the first half, which is unusual for us. But all in all, I mean, like uh, it's it was still a very good uh, attacking performance, and it's another bonus point. And I'm think like I think this team they won't talk about it publicly, but they may they may, one of their goals might be five five from five, you know, five five bonus point wins mm-hmm. as well, you know. Like I don't know what they're. Like they wanted to create history, they want to inspire a nation, all that stuff. And and a grand slam in itself is 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 massive. We know how hard it is to go back to back. But could you go back to back with um with five bonus point wins? That'd be some statement. Yeah, and, and as usual, we're talking so much about the attack when the foundation for the last couple of years now has just been how hard Ireland are to, to break down defensively. Um three tries conceded in total through the tournament, two of those penalty tries, only one in open play as such. We might talk about the discipline side of things in a couple of minutes, but first of all, just just Bernard, how tough Ireland are to break down at the moment. It was 34 minutes into the game before Wales got an entry into the, 20, into the, the Irish 22, and I know during the second half they had a couple of good sustained periods in, in the Irish 22 and close to the line, but pretty much every time Ireland are coming up with that turnover. Yeah, it's a uh... It's an incredibly impressive defense. I, I was pitch side and um like even if Wales got a 
a decent half carry or or even from a quick tap where they're on the front foot, within seconds Ireland are perfectly in shape again, and it was just so hard for Wales to to break down. And Wales looked lost a little bit, but I think that was down to the fact that they they just couldn't find any real weak entry points. Um, we got the discipline one was an interesting one. So we 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 gave away three penalties for for counter rooks. Um, so um, and then two more for for jackal. Jack, or tr- three for jackal offences. Uh, one where I think Porter didn't run out away in time. Uh, Bundy for putting his hands on the ground. Um, James Lowe got done for a neck roll on the edge, uh, which is quite. It's unusual to get done for a neck roll on a counter hook, but he did. In fairness, um, he did uh, in, in, uh, infringe there. John McCarthy, I think, took out the nine once. Uh, so we, yeah, we just got caught barging a little bit. Three times we got caught basically for for that barge and. That's been a big part of our ability to slow down opposition ball. I thought Andrea PRD was very fussy, like incredibly fussy, and even you know the not the, the not straight in the scrum for Wales was just a sign of it being really technically I yeah, suppose, efficient. Ping them, them as well for a free kick for a camera which player, but yeah. they're, they're too close to the line out. So yeah, all technical offences. Yeah, and I felt look, they are there to be refed. It's yeah. just um, unfortunately, I would say that uh, the problem is for the, for the players. Um, obviously it's his first Six Nations game and he wants to be you know bang on he wants to have a positive review and he's he's refereeing the laws um, which is, it's hard to be critical of him but in general I would say he was nearly too fussy and it's not unless it's not something that the referees have been doing or the coaches have been told they're going to be much stricter on it so we saw a lot of penalties in the game which probably affected a little bit but yeah I think from a defensive point of view Ireland looked very comfortable but of course Easterby will be looking at all those penalties and in detail and seeing what we can do better because against the better opposition, you know, we'll have to be very careful um, giving them those soft outs. Is there though, Johnny and Bert, you can come in afterwards as well. Is is there any part of of this where we see now this is three games in a row where Ireland are high enough on the penalty count? They're what thirty seven, I think, across the across the three games uh, by four or five. They're the the highest across the Six Nations. They've had, um, I think it's three yellow cards now in three games when they had only had two in the previous, I think, 29 or so, or three in the previous 29 matches. Um, are they, like is Simon Easterby or Andy Farlow, whoever, is he giving the players a little bit more license to push the boundaries a bit around the rock and be a little bit more aggressive and take a few more chances knowing that they're going to to back themselves defensively? Or is that just is that me trying to think maybe a few moves too far ahead? No, I think like if you're going to go after a break, then yeah, you have to be willing to give up one or two more penalties, maybe. But you can't say we'll get it all back. Like you can't allow players to give away penalties. Yeah, sorry, sorry, the way the way I I mean it is that we'll say like if 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 they think, for example, okay, we'll go with this strategy and we might give up three or four extra penalties, but it might lead to us making. Uh, four or five more dominant tackles or a couple of extra turnovers. Is there, is there a trade off to make with, with how aggressive you want to be? No, I I don't really think so. Like when you're doing that, you can still have your discipline. I know what you're saying. And I I would agree to a small degree, but like, you know, things like Jameson Gibson Park having his hands on the ground when he's blasting through. Um, When, when Wales got done, like Joe McCarthy, did he take an arm in the line out or something like that? I think he interfered in the line out. Um, Wales already got done for cheating in with their plus in the line out and, and Ireland got done for cheating in with their plus. That's a that's a tactical call. You know he's called it. You've decided to do it and you've gotten done on it. So I, th- I think there's actually a small bit of naivety in there. Uh, I think the one Andrew Porter, did he poach while Josh van der Fleer couldn't get away or was it the other way around? Other but, way around, yeah. The other way around. While, while, there was, while there was someone in around that, you know to be clever. you know. So I think, I think they'll be as harsh on the players in terms of those penalty concessions because, you know, against England and Twickenham, it's grand saying, but we had enough in the tank and we have enough in our attack and our defence is really good because if you look at the stats compared to the first three rounds last year, Ireland are at half the points conceded or something like that on average, aren't they? And um, opposition 22 metre entries are way, way down. I think it's four now per, per game versus 10 last year or something like that. I just saw some stats on, on Twitter or X as it's now called that I can't uh, get my head around. But, um, you know, so I think they're they're massively improved in their, like, we're, we're talking about the defence being unbelievably uh, improved and then also their attack is, is humming without Johnny Sexton imagine you know that's what the big thing was before the whole tournament can we do it without Johnny Sexton and uh, 
and at the moment they're making his retirement uh, a little bit softer because they're they're going really well. But you can't go to Twickenham and get a yellow card or get uh, or give away that many entries because England are eventually going to gel, as we saw in the World Cup as well. Fair enough, for whatever side of the draw they went to, but like they're going to gel, and don't let it be when Ireland go to Twickenham for them to spoil our party. Like you know, because we've done it to them plenty in the past, and that'll be that'll be a highly frustrating one if they if they get our number because of discipline or yellow cards or a little bit of uh, um, looseness around breakdown, I would say. How do you feel about that one, Bernard, in terms of the, the discipline? Would you be... No, I would... Look, at obviously, there's a couple there that we need to need to be a little bit smarter on, but I do think there is... There's, there's, there's that accepted risk around pushing the boundaries um, and... The fact that you will maybe give away a few more, but the net effect over the course of the game in terms of turnovers won or, or rook speed affected from a defensive point of view would actually be be worth it. I think it's a more aggressive Irish defence. Uh, it's a it's it's an offence that's taken more risk in the, in the, uh, it's, not, it's, it's a offence that's willing to take more risk than it was in the World Cup. And whether that's just part of Simon's, you know, review of of the World Cup and, and what they what they could do better. It wasn't something that we flagged as a as a potential weakness going into the World Cup, but obviously on, on that one day, uh, we got caught a couple of times um, and, and it hurt us. Our attack wasn't able to um, to get us out of trouble. Um, and then whether it's the Nina Bayer influence in Leinster and, and some of those players kind of saying, look, at this this is working for us at, in, in, in blue. Um, but together, they've actually... They've, they've created something that I think fear the opposition now fear defence as much as our attack and that's a, like I don't think that was the case before I think our defence statistically wasn't bad it was, it was sorry statistically was good but there was no fear in it um, and I think that um, I think that's a very strong place for it to be, to be. and obviously now we have our, our line out back on track I know we lost a couple at the back at the weekend but it, I think they were thrown to space it was just slightly overthrown yeah and, like and they the were they were very adventurous throws yeah. like right to the tail and yeah those yeah, there, like high risk throws were, to begin with oh, absolutely so yeah. again um, but statistically overall over the three games our line it's back where we want it to be and then as I said uh, against the head our son against the head the scrum um, was a real positive for us and uh, like that's something if we have all those eight key areas we know our kicking game is good um, there's not a huge amount to be overly worried about, but obviously you got to try and make sure you keep applying those. On England then, Ireland and England at Twickenham on the 9th of March. Johnny, we've, we've always seen Ireland have been great underdogs. And I think it goes back to almost what you were saying about Andy Farrell earlier on in this podcast when he came into Munster and said, um, like, you're being aggressive and adventurous in defence, but you're not doing it necessarily in attack. And is it you know, it nearly goes down to our just kind of natural shyness and kind of fear of making a fuss about ourselves or or humility. But have, have do you think Ireland are at a stage of where they're embracing being favourites a little bit more or is there still, are they still kind of backing off from that ever so slightly? No, I think they're absolutely embracing it. I think that's Andy Farrell's whole whole thing with Gary Keegan in the background maybe, um, that they're very comfortable with what they're doing and Sure, we, we saw it going into the World Cup, they were allowed to talk about the World Cup for two years, they were, you know, so I think that's a, I think maybe Andy Farrell's best trait at the moment is taking the Irishness out of that, like, you know, that we're, um, we're embracing being on top and staying on top kind of a thing, you know, so uh, I don't think going to Twickenham is going to make them fear that, you know, but like they're, um, they're certainly going into a, a tougher place, I think, at the moment, and just, just back on the defence, like we've, we played Wales who weren't doing much in attack, I know they can be uh, dogged but like France obviously aren't at it at the moment I think Scotland will be the one that will really test this Irish team um, from a strategic tactical perspective England are probably the ones that have their backs to the wall in Twickenham uh, in round four you've got two really heavy ones coming um, but no I, I think Ireland Ireland are in a really good place in terms of backing themselves and unfortunately I keep thinking like imagine if the World Cup was this year again like you know I'd love to have another crack off it it's, uh, it's really frustrating they're in such a good place and I think they're really embracing that uh, but they just seem to be, they're a joy to watch at the moment. They're, they're so, so good. You know, you sit down and watch a game and you're blown away by them every time there's a tactical change or there's, there's something else going on. You know, there's, there's a lot going on with them and it's, uh, they're, they're leaders, you know, they're leaders in, in the game at the moment and that's really cool. I think we need to kind of bring in some sort of World Cup swear jar. Yeah. One of us mentions it for now. I mean, just throw two <laughs> euro in, end of the season, we'll give the, we'll give the pot to charity or something like that. Um, On England, Birch, like, 
it's hard to it's hard to overstate how poor they were for large stretches of that game on Saturday. You have to expect there's going to be a backlash next week against Ireland, but how much better can they actually get? Even I think they, a big backlash. I look, they can definitely get better because some of their skill sets um, was mind mind boggling poor. Like they, they're there's players there who. Um, on a weekly basis for for their clubs uh, are far better than that. It was really strange. I, I know that they're they're kind of caught a little bit in terms of what they what they did under Bortwick for whatever those eight months going into the World Cup, and then this pressure to evolve a Twickenham fan base who who aren't happy. You know, we think we've got problems in the Viva um, with atmosphere. You know, there's a big negativity in Twickenham, not just with the atmosphere, but what's happening on the field. Um, and it's 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 a typical one for Bortwick, who naturally is a conservative coach, a very very data driven guy, and yet there's pressure on from outside and and internally as well. I think from players to evolve because when you watch how Northampton or Quinns Saracens play, it's not as um as, as I suppose conservative as as Bortwick under England or or, or with Leicester. Did um and at the moment they seem to be cutting in between, but I think they like you, you'd be shocked if those errors happened again because those players are too good uh, to do that. And um, but collectively, is their game in a place where we should be really worried? No, it's not. The only only worry I would have is if they go back to complete, you know, Bortwick ball. Um, the South Africa, is, the South Africa World yeah, Cup semi final. Yeah, 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 every game in the World Cup, yeah. but obviously. Every every game of the World Cup. Now, in fairness, it was a bit easier for them to implement it against South Africa because the that's that, yeah, and, and that's South Africa's game as well. You know, um, that's South Africa's natural game. So you had two two teams with similar philosophies, so it balanced itself out a little bit. Um, they obviously had a big emotional rush for that. It was a World Cup semi final. They knew they had a, they were they were massive underdogs, which they will be against us. Um, but I don't see I don't see how they can improve their attacking game enough. In two weeks, what is, what, two what, weeks. What, is, what is their attacking game? If either of you can give me a, a sense of it, because we're 18, 19 games into Steve. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I don't think I don't think you can judge. You can only judge them on two, to be honest, uh, Neil. I think um, there was no effort, there was no intent to evolve their attacking game to the World Cup. He, he right. got that job so late. He literally said, "Look at that, I'm I'm going to bring what I believe is the best way to win Test matches, and that will." that will get us as far as we can in, in a World Cup. I think it's only really the last two games that, that we've seen, I think, to be fair, because he hasn't wanted to, but he's like, does he really want to? Does he really want to evolve? Like, it's very hard for a coach who's naturally so kick-based. And when I say kick-based, I, I mean long kicking um, and meters um, to go into this kind of free free, free playing or, or a team of more balance. And, and like, the problem is, again, is, his coaching staff are unbelievably Leicester based, you know. So the scrum coach is Leicester, Wigglesworth is Leicester, and they have a similar philosophy. Kevin Sinfield has been moved from defence to skills, uh, so he doesn't have a huge influence over it. Um, they had a guy, uh, Andrew Strawbridge, uh, over from New Zealand, mm-hmm. doing some attacking breakdown stuff. He's had to go back now. He was he was just there for a short term contract. He's gone back to the Chiefs, and then Felix doing the attack uh, or defence. Sorry, so. Uh, it's 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 very unclear, and that's 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 why I I wonder. At a risk of the damage of losing by twenty five points in Twickenham, if he tries to continue to evolve, he doesn't park up the bus and go right. You know the most important thing now is a performance, potentially a win against Ireland, and what are our best chances of doing that? Statistically, his best chance of doing that is to go back to to Plan A, um, and decide to basically. Evolved the game on a summer tour, November, etc. But the, the the problem is now that that defeat in Scotland and the manner of it, I think, um, is going to make him question the how intelligent it is to try and change mid tournament. Johnny, what do you think of them? Oh, I, I, there's a couple of um, phases in the game where I thought, what is their strategy? You know, I I saw them come off a line out maybe thirty meters out, and they were going around the corner, and they didn't beat Scotland up, which you think they would do. Uh, and they weren't able to do that. And then, you know, you go back to those kind of pods, like a one three three one or the variations that other teams were playing, like Ireland. And they tried to go to that, and they had one moment where, I don't know, it was Finn Smith on the pitch at the time, but uh, to the first pot of forwards, they swept it at the back. And uh, it got to 
Ali Lawrence, who threw a, a pass that you swear there was another person outside Ben Earl and went into touch. And Ben Earl's face as he was going towards the camera was just like in disbelief of possibly how poor they could play at that time. So there was two parts of that, one really tight and one where they were actually trying to play a bit of ball. And you're wondering, what is their strategy and how can it be so poor? There's 22 turnovers and 25 handling errors, isn't there? And I think, you know, England have some outrageously good backs. Like Furbank dropped the ball for the Vendor Merva try. You're wondering what's going on with him because he shoots the lights out with Northampton. Like howler, of, howler of a pass from George Ford. Mm. Was it really? Like it was, it was, oh, it was at his face. It was at his face. And he, I mean, had, he had to jump to try catch it. I know that, but like a player of his skill set, you know, you're going, and even, um, you know, George Ford, he played with bats when they were unbelievable. Yeah. Like all these hitting boot lines and they were, they were playing off, like not off the cuff because that's a silly term, but they were decision making in every phase. Like they were really, really good at it. I don't, I'm not sure about uh, Ali Lawrence in the middle of the pitch. He's obviously there for, for go forward. Uh, but they've got so many good options. I know Mitchell's been a loss. But Danny Kerr and Harlequins, like Harlequins have played that kind of rugby as well. I know it's a step up. Possibly the, the downfall is that their forwards aren't the forward profile of Ireland, if you look at it that way. Like they're not the big, um, they're not the ball handling kind of passing forwards that you would expect. Like I'd say George Martin will come back into that, give him a bit of a bit of weight into the into the pack and I'm just not sure. And, and at the same time, you know, you've got some Saracens in there, like, you know, Jamie George. They can play it. I just don't know why. Maybe they're not, uh, they didn't play with that 15 or that 23 or whatever. So maybe they're not gelled that way. But like, there's a lot of Northampton influence. And I, I don't understand why they're not leaning into that a bit more. Birch is probably touching it. The, the coaching staff haven't leaned into it. But they've got the tools. Like, I'm, I'm convinced they have the tools to be able to play a bit of a hybrid of that, have the bit of uh, the, the big up front. Um, the set piece game and also be able to throw the ball around with good decision making. I'm not sure why they're not going there. It, just on just on England, sorry, it's um it's really interesting. Like they have um a very a very experienced group, right? Still hanging around. Um, so the the Danny Kerr, the Joe Marler, the the uh, Dan yeah. Cole, Dan Cole, etc. Um, who've been unbelievable like servants. Uh, but probably the two fellas of that generation that they would like to have. Courtney Laws and Owen Farrell have stepped away, you know, f- voluntarily. You know what I mean? I would actually say they'd be better off having those two back in and maybe um, get rid of some of the fellas they still have uh, there. And it's just, it, it's it's a real tough one, and, and it just shows you the the how hard it was to be an international player like for England over the last couple of years with under Eddie and then under under Bortwick. To be fair, because even though they got to a World Cup semi final and they played brilliantly in the semi final. I mean, they, they certainly didn't get much um, praise or, or admiration from their fans. And and Courtney and, and, and Owen Farrell deciding to step away from it when they're still very good players. Um, and, and obviously, Bortwick's now left with another crop of them. But when does he start to, to change them over? Um, and look, they've only lost um, lost one game, you know, so they're, they're still in the, in the hunt for the championship. But on form, you would say Ireland should be good enough to go and win in Twickenham. Um and then has he lost an opportunity to to bring through more players or um has doubled down on what what they want to do or may, look at again maybe he's maybe if his natural game is is the way they play in the World Cup well then the RFU just need to back that and or decide that's what they want to play because it's very hard to get a coach who believes in a certain way of playing and then tell him because the fans aren't happy um that he has to evolve if that's not his skill set. Well, yeah, I mean, the fans will like it if it's if it's ugly and winning rugby. The fans yes. will will come round to it. I think that's the that's a fact. On on Scotland, we'll we'll end up talking about them a lot more. I think in the next few weeks, but um, a few couple of small bits on them. Doing Van der Merwe, three great tries and all that. Um, that finish for the first one. He's done that before earlier on this season for Edinburgh against the Bulls. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock him because it was a hat trick in a Calcutta Cup game. It like it's, it's historic stuff, an unbelievable day. But anytime I see that try now, I just can't help thinking, Johnny, this is going to end in tears at some point soon. It's the one he's jumping out over. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, it's, was... it's, it's, it's the second time he's done that, like that unnecessary dive for the corner. I'm just looking at it, going, oh, oh, god, this is. I'm get, I'm getting anxiety looking at it, like. He wants the highlight reel, I think. He has enough of a highlight reel now that he doesn't need to be diving in over the side. Because when I was watching it, I was like, he actually nearly went to his left to jump in over the corner flag. Do you know what what it's like, Bernard? You'll understand this now because you're a horse. It's like when a horse jumps to the left coming up to a fence or something like that. (laughs) It was was bizarre. I I actually, the first look, I thought maybe he'd actually made a mess of it, which would have been incredible. But uh, 
yeah, he's five tries again in two games against England. Um, with the ball in hand, he's he's probably the best winger in the world. Obviously, I don't think he's the best winger in the world uh, in, in general, but with the ball in hand, he's he's exceptionally good. Yeah, look, I'm only like I'm only kind of taking the mick yeah. there. Um, on a more serious point though, and you kind of stress with the ball in hand, he's excellent. Are Scotland very very vulnerable off first phases? Like that that first try that England scored, they got fairly cut open. You look back at. I remember in the game against France, Birch, you went through like just how yeah. much of a mess they made off that scrum for Louis Bielberry's mm. try. You look back at the Ireland game at the at the World Cup when Ireland just tore through them early on off off first phase stuff. Like, is is that a little bit of a worry now for them? Just like it, obviously it's not happening a handful of times every game, but it only has to happen once in every game for it to be very very costly. Yeah, I think the the serious weakness is there, um, and without that certainty, uh, particularly off set piece, uh, they're going to be very vulnerable when they when it comes to Dublin against um, uh, against uh, Ireland because Ireland will will see opportunities there and they'll execute. So um, look, they're del- they're delighted to bounce back. They're they're calling it the fan slam or um, that they're going for. Uh, they feel hard done by. They feel it should be three from three. Um, I'm not convinced by them. Uh, I think they're the second best team in the competition, to be fair. But I, I don't think if we handle England in Twickenham, I don't think we'll have any issues with Scotland. What do you think of them overall, Johnny? As as an overall package, are they kind of the the second tier in a in a three tier competition? Is this kind of Ireland out in their own, Scotland out in their own, and then like a, a bunch of four scrapping underneath us? I don't think you can put them that far away. I mean, like if that if that game was in Murrayfield, it's home advantage is converting that a little bit easier. If that was in Murrayfield, I I, I think we'd find it very hard. Um, but uh, yeah, like Ireland are better than us, I think. But we'll we'll see if they are when, when they get to play each other. We're not going to be too preemptive with that. But I think uh, Bernard is right, like. But I, I I think I like the way they play the game. They're brilliant to watch. They're very effective. They're you know they're they're ticking a lot of boxes and and they're actually getting results now. I know the first one, like you know, it's it's gonna it's gonna haunt them for a while, but it's. Uh, you know, I, I, the way they play the game, Van der Merwe being so uh, destructive, they're they're upsetting opposition set piece. You know, they've done that a bit. They had a couple of line of turnovers again at the weekend, uh, and and England like their set piece. You know, so I think they're they're very good at disrupting the opposition. But now they're playing well. They they've been playing that that kind of brand of rugby for a while now as well. But it's not. You know, there's a case of um, you score a couple and we score a couple and we see where we end up at the end. I think they're getting a bit more effective than that now, and I think that's the danger. You know, if they do hit the ground running. Um, two Pilato's injured now, isn't he? So I wonder how, how bad that is because that center partnership is so so hard to deal with. Um, obviously I I, I didn't like the defense from England when you see the back view of the of the first Van der Merwe try. I thought it was poor. Um, was it Lawrence maybe came up with and and the back of it? I'm not sure who it was, but they really came up. Uh, as Felix would be, you know, promoting him to get out and, and shut it down at the back, but they didn't have all the threats in the front of the pitch covered, and uh, it was a very very simple. Um, mm. 9, 12, tip to 13. It was very, very simple to go through like that. But they do have uh, players that can execute that and I think they can be quite dangerous there. They've Italy next up, Birch. Um, this, I suppose we can kind of fold this into an Italy-France yeah. chat as well. Like When you look at Italy, considering they started out England, Ireland, France for the first three games, three points out of that is a decent enough return for Casada coming in and his in his first year in charge off the back of that disastrous World Cup. But do you think Italy would sort of be prioritising that last game against Wales a little bit more than Scotland? I don't think they need to now with the, with the two follow weeks. I think... Um, okay, so they can they can just go yeah. for both of them now. Yeah, I think they will go for both. Um, I certainly... Uh, I think I said in the pod, I met, I met them, uh, the coach, some of the coaches before the Ireland-Italy game and they had already planned pre-competition you know where they saw each team's strengths and weaknesses, and and they weren't in any way. They were very much um, respectful of Ireland and all teams, but they they didn't see Ireland as being an area that they really could go after in in anything in terms of the tools that they had at their disposal. But there was opportunities against England, and they actually, in fairness, they found those. Um, there was opportunities against uh, France, which they did in the second half, in particular. Obviously, France were a man down, but um, they thought that Scotland and, and Wales were games that they could be very competitive in. So I think now the boost they're going to get from that draw, and obviously it's not as good as what a, w- a win would be, but they they'll see that as being a, a serious statement and on their way to redemption from what was a horrible World Cup for them. 
Um, Casada is very well liked and well respected. Um, and he's got that kind of res- good result. England and um and a, a draw against France is uh, is more than decent and I think they they'll grow into this competition, but yeah, logically it's it's Wales is their next most likely win. Speaking of Wales and speaking of France, how vulnerable vulnerable are France against Wales next week? France are incredibly vulnerable. I don't know. Um, obviously they have another week off, to, sort of two week lead in. Um. But yeah, I, I, I'm just hearing like there's a really bad vibe amongst the, the coaching uh, playing playing group because the coaches aren't at the level that they had pre World Cup. And look at the, they've made financial decisions like they put so, the, the French Federation put everything into that national team's prep for the last four years, and that included paying top fourteen rates for coaches. You know, uh, whereas historically, um, you made less money being part of the French coaching staff than you could in the top 14 uh, club system. They've lost two of those back to the club. So the attack coach, Lauren Labisse, um, and the line coach, Kareem Gazelle, are going back to Stade Francais together, where they're doing a great job. Um, uh, and they've been replaced by players or coaches who haven't the same level of experience or, or quality, apparently. Um, plus there's the whole hangover the World Cup. And you look at France in the first three games. I mean, okay, they went to the power game against Italy for the first half. And it was very effective, to be fair. But um, every time they pulled the trigger and went to the backs, they messed it up. And like this is world class players like Dante, Jalibert, Penno, just look completely out of form. Um, and then obviously the second half, Dante gives away that red card. And the second half, they're they're very loose. But um, against Ireland, it's not really clear what their attack philosophy is. Their first phase strikes were really poor. Um, and it seems to be very much back to the old days. All just rely on an individual to do something. Um and without the punt there and maybe a lack of purpose and, and kind of drive towards something huge which the World Cup was, they they look back to the days when we went, What the fuck is wrong with French rugby? You know what I mean? And it's that's mm-hmm. in that's in four months. They've just gone from being genuine contenders and like I mean they could have easily won that quarter final. They they played amazing in it, uh, some amazing rugby and now they look like they're just, you know, um, stragglers. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. Would it would it make you reevaluate what you've seen from the over the last few years and kind of consider well how much, how much of this was Dupont just grabbing games by the scruff of the neck and doing things, or or is the system entirely kind of falling apart? No, 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 no. I think it's the system. I, I think Dupont is amazing, but like Luke is a very very good player. Yeah. Um, so just so like you're not you're not saying put Dupont into this team, they're going to be. Look, maybe, maybe, maybe off the field, he could challenge coaches, you know, um, and make sure there's a really strong plan. Maybe he can motivate the players who who, who kind of look a little bit uh, lethargic. But I, I think the, I think when you see that they've got a fella like Luku and and uh, like uh, like Garak and stuff, who like they've got very good nines as well. Obviously, Dupont is the best player in the world. He's going to make a team vastly better. But it's so bad that I think you have to look elsewhere. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think you have to look at the coaching. Um and there has been changes there and obviously they haven't they haven't hit their stride yet. Johnny, Maybe last but no, go ahead, sorry, Johnny. Yeah, it's not that I think they were tending up on the stroke at halftime. Yeah, penalty with a red card is a uh, coaches will be looking at that going, what are, have we done here? Another half Ooh. with only... Dante's fourth oh. card of the season: two reds and two yellows. I mean, like he was so good for Larishel. He was. I remember previewing Larishel being like this guy in the middle of the pitch. Mm. Luke Gaining going forward and destructing every breakdown in defence and he was unplayable for Leinster at times you know and you're looking at him now going what, what has he done he wasn't even anywhere near Brex for that ta- that challenge yeah. like, he wasn't really going to impact it he just had a uh, his own solo run and decided to go on and, and get stuck in and uh, and whatever if it's a mistake you know obviously a fella can make a mistake and they can get their timing wrong um, but on the stroke half time 10 nil to 10-3 and, and a man down I think that that was you know coaches you could you can get into the coaching structure and everything and, and Bernard knows way more than me on that. But then you're looking at that going, we still put him into 10-0 and uh, and what have they done to us. But then the other thing that, and I didn't see a lot of the game, I, I saw highlights and I saw 10 minutes here at the end of it. Uh, so I won't I won't make too much of a, um, a fuss of it. But I, I saw a few minutes where um, they were just absolutely highly frustrated. A couple of passes didn't go to hand and Penno 
was hands up and puffing cheeks and you're like, oh God, French rugby has gone back five to ten yeah. years. You know, so it was it was really frustrating because like they're they're, they're frustrated, but France were like last year you're going Ireland and France, you're like, you're thinking this is the pinnacle of rugby. Like and now mm. you look at them getting frustrated, their mindset is weak, their defence isn't the same, Sean Edwards isn't having the, the same effect on them and all of a sudden they're gone um, you know, back to the old French ways. Yeah, I was saying on Sunday it was it was a great it was a great throwback for the uh, the slow motion slow motion footage of <laughs> exasperated facial expressions on French <laughs> rugby players. It's a classic of the genre altogether. Uh, Johnny, I will give the final word to you though, because just on that kick at the end, uh, you're the kicker here. Myself and Barsh definitely aren't. If you're in that situation, um, and the ball drops off the tee, and you have the French players kind of half encroaching or half just kind of running up and back, and no one really sure what's going on. A shot clock is running down. Are you in that moment throwing your hands up into the air and letting the referee know exactly what's going on? Despite the fact that you're taking a little bit of a risk there at the time and he tells you to get on with it? Uh, I think you'll probably have a... You, you give out, but is the frustration with yourself? I think kickers would be very internal, you know. the He probably has a bit to answer for there himself. But like... I'm, and, talking, and, I'm talking before he takes the kick even. Just a kind of a, here, here, look, look what's going on here. Not not saying like you know he hits the post and says oh can I take that one again? Yeah, I I think if you're doing that, you're nearly halfway out of the kick anyway, aren't you? Like the, people will talk about small spots behind the post and you block everything out. I'm not sure if I ever got to that level. But you like you hear things quite clearly. You see people doing things, but you pretend to ignore it. Um, I I think he'll be really frustrated with with not converting that. You know, there's obviously a bit of a mess on the run up to it. The ball has gone off the tee. They're kind of encroaching, but they encroach. I know not the same degree now, but they encroach and convert all the time, and we don't really get too spooked about it, you know. So maybe it's because they're not allowed to, and there's a load of factors in there. But if your mindset is that you're going to win this game, and he converted from the touchline unbelievably well before that, so he was kicking well. But if your mindset is I'm the man to win this game for us, you just put that ball over the bar, like. Right, I don't know. I'd be making a fuss. Great <laughs> <laughs> afterwards, but you know, I think if. When you're when you're kicking and your mindset is rock solid and you go through phases, I get of, yeah, I get you. You go through phases of being absolutely weak and you go through phases that no one's going to stop you from putting the ball over the bar. I think if you're in the position that you're a match winner, you know you'll kick it and then you'll be like, they can't do that again. Or I I I'd allow them to complain afterwards, obviously, because not yeah. we're not always in a position where we're rock solid. You 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 squirt balls over the bar. Sometimes they should never have gone over. So like once ninety percent of it is right. But I think he can, he's he's well within his rights to complain afterwards. But I think if he's going to be the top ten, he just puts that over regardlessly. Right. Well, hopefully Paolo Garbisi has his moment before the end of the Six Nations because he deserves it after that. Uh, no Six Nations this weekend. Obviously, Cardiff against Leinster is the game on RT two and RT player this week in the United Rugby Championship live on from seven pm. Coverage gets underway. I'm we'll also have a live blog on the RT Sports uh, or the RT Sport app as well. Uh, Johnny, big game for you with Cork on the uh, with Cork on this weekend the way to Lansdowne. Bert, are you on URC duty or? or yeah, I'm on. Uh, I'm on World Feed um, in Cork on on Friday night. Uh, so yeah, very good. Well, best of luck with uh, whatever you. this week, and we'll speak to you again next week. Johnny and Bernard, all the best. Thanks. Thanks.